Colton uh, as he preaches the word to us. Thank you, Dr. Colton. Well, it's good to be back. It's been a little while, and uh, maybe you remember we were in the book of Philippians. I've been going through Philippians, so uh, I, try, I try to remember how long did I start Philippians ago, but I can't remember. It's been a little while, but nevertheless, a wonderful book, and there's still uh, time left, space in the book. So we're in Philippians uh, chapter uh, 3, and just for the quickest of summaries, Paul is... Uh, imprisoned under house arrest, probably shackled to two Roman centurions. He was, uh, of course, traveling through Europe to evangelize, and yet he's being stymied. Uh, Here he is sitting in house arrest, uh, and yet uh, he knows God will not be stopped, and he can actually be full of joy, and the book is full of joy. So we see that even in our text Uh, this morning. So Philippians chapter 3, verses uh, 1 through 11, and this is a tremendous text. Uh, Last time I preached it, I said, I don't know if I can do it justice, but I pray that the Holy Spirit will certainly apply it to our lives. So this is uh, the Word of God, Philippians 3, 1 through 11. Paul writes, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and it, it and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But... Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And may God indeed Bless this, the reading, hearing, and preaching of his word, and let's ask uh, for his blessing in our own lives even now. Let's pray. Father, we do want to hear from you, and we have met you here. We have sung your praise. We have recognized that in Christ you hold us fast. You are the God that we need, and we need you moment by moment. So we pray, Father, that we uh, might have ears to hear, eyes, spiritual eyes to see uh, what you have to tell us, to show us. Get this sinner out of the way, and may you work by your Holy Spirit's power, and may we be encouraged by you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Harry Dent shocked everybody. He was surprising both believers and skeptics. When the news broke out because there had been rumblings throughout the Columbia community through the grapevine that old Harry, 
the former Nixon aide was getting religion. His daughter, Jenny, and her, her husband, Alton, had become Christian fanatics as teenagers in 1971. And it raised all kinds of questions for Jenny's father, Harry, which he had coolly avoided. But in the late 70s, Harry started talking, in public, no doubt, about the meaning of life. And the theme that life has a bottom line kept coming up. Then Harry shocked everyone. In 1981, when he resigned from his extremely prestigious and prosperous legal practice in Columbia to enter Columbia Bible College now, Columbia International University, where he had actually forbidden his daughter eight years previously from attending. He was enrolling to become a lay Baptist minister. The talk around town, around Columbia, was that Harry had lost his mind. He had had some sort of religious experience. But Harry Dent, the millionaire politician and lawyer, explained that everything he had done, all that he had accomplished, all of his success had left him empty. They were useless before God, and now he wanted to spend the rest of his life serving God full time, which he did. Harry Dent had been a rather self-confident, self-reliant person. But he realized that all of his efforts had gotten him nowhere. The only confidence he had as he looked at God's bottom line would be in Christ Jesus. And we see a similar sentiment in Philippians 3 as the Apostle Paul opens his heart. He gets very personal here. He tells us something of his life experience uh, in these pages of Philippians. And we learn a lot about where we're to put our confidence in this life. The first thing that Paul talks about is the deception of false confidence. What is your confidence in life? Now, again, we mentioned Paul is in how, under house arrest in prison, Roman imprisonment. He's actually implied in the previous verses that he might die. He says, I'm being poured out, and the picture was being poured out. This might be the end. It might be poured out completely. But he turns to these believers in the midst of really very difficult circumstances, and he calls them to rejoice. He has told them at the end of chapter 2 that he is going to, he can't be with them, and if you recall, he started the church 10 years earlier, and he's like, I, I can't get back, but I'm going to send you my right hand and my left hand man, Timothy and Epaphroditus. So rejoice. And how do you rejoice? You rejoice in the Lord. It's a theme of Paul. It's joy and rejoicing, but it's in the Lord. No matter what your circumstances are. I had a young man a couple of years ago. He had finished at uh, Charlotte Christian School. He played baseball there. I've gotten to know the, some of the baseball players there. And he'd gone off to college. He'd gone on to a, a very uh, high-profile university to play baseball. And then COVID hit. And I was like, I mean, it sort of like it stalled his career, right? And uh, I won't say it ruined it, but he decided under all the circumstances, to transfer somewhere else. Not as prestigious. But in my conversation, I said, man, that had to be tough. I mean, when COVID came, it did a lot. But I mean, it may have ruined your career. And he said these simple words, God is in control. Whew. How do you rejoice? 
You rejoice in the Lord, a God that you know is working. He's working in your life. And Paul says, to write these things to you is no trouble to me. Look, I'm writing you this letter, and I'm glad to write you this letter. I want you to rejoice. I know you have troubles, but this isn't trouble for me, and it's actually safe or a safeguard for you. And the word there, safe, speaks of a firm foundation, a certainty. Paul says, I want to strengthen your faith. So I'm writing to keep you safe. What's he keeping them safe from? Look out for the dogs. Hmm. It's an admonition of caution. Look out. Watch out. It's what we yell at our children when they're going too close to the street or doing something possibly dangerous. Look out! And Paul's doing it for these spiritual children. And what is the problem? There is a danger. It's a danger of deception. There are false teachers weaving their way into this church. And this was always happening in the first century. And it is happening today. They're false teachers. They appreciate grace, but they add works to grace. They appreciate Christ, but they add law to Christ. And Paul says, look out for the dogs. These are not pet poodles with neatly trimmed hair oozing with perfume, prancing about for a contest. Now, these are wild, ugly, large scavengers, mad, unclean. Paul is insulting them. Watch out for those dogs, those false teachers. Back in college, I worked in a Christian camp. And one week I got there early the night before the camp started. No one else was there. And uh, I had to park up here and walk all the way down to these uh, cement block cabins. And it was dark late at night. And it was eerie enough just to walk through all those woods. But then I was there by myself. I got into the cabin. I went to bed just a little nervous. And in the middle of the night, I heard vicious barking out of nowhere. It woke me up. I looked out the window, and there was a, a wild pack of dogs just barking, growling. I don't know what they were looking for, but I knew the front door was locked, the only door. But I mean, I went into the bathroom and locked that door too. It was a bit frightening. I mean, there's no way they should get in, but it doesn't matter. It's unnerving, and Paul says, here, look out for these dogs, these false teachers. It's very unnerving. They're coming after you. And then he says, look out for the evil doers. This is a little play on words, because Paul could have said, look out for these evil people, but he calls them evil doers. This was their problem. You see, they were adding doing to the work of Christ to get right with God. Oh, when we embrace Christ and we receive God's grace, yes, it does create obedience, love for God, service. But they were, Christ wasn't enough. You got to do. Watch out for those evil doers. And it's scary because evil doers can appear to be respectable religious people. They look good because they're doing. They might be in the church, but they're not trusting in Christ alone for their salvation. And then Paul says, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. It looks like a strange phrase, but he's going to explain it, but he's actually being sarcastic. They are putting their trust in 
the surgical removal of the flesh, speaking of circumcision. They said, Christ is a lot, but he's not enough. You still, they're Judaizers, they have Jewish influences. You have to be circumcised. That's the only way you can get into the kingdom. And Paul says, really, they're botching the whole gospel. He's overstating it. Circumcision for them has ruined it all. They're mutilating the flesh. It's become an extreme deception. Paul is trying to say, don't trust in this sign. Trust in the Savior alone. He corrects the deception. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Christians are people whose hearts have been cut. God has surgically removed a calloused, unrepentant, unbelieving spirit. And that's the question for each of us. Has the Word of God, has the need in our lives, pierced our hearts so that we have become broken before God. And we worship Him by the Spirit's power. And we have a heart that loves Him because of what He has done at the cross. Have you embraced the gospel? Have you embraced Jesus Christ? Have you turned from your sins and given your life to Him? That's what the Christian life is about. If you haven't, I appeal that you will. Or are you going through the motions? Are you just doing the right things? Are you looking good? They are proud or confident in themselves. Paul says, no, our pride is in Christ alone. Not your own efforts. We put, Paul says, no confidence in the flesh. And again, he's a play on words here as he deals with this concept of circumcision, but it's, it's works, it's effort, it's what I do. Paul says, no confidence there. That's the deception of false confidence. But now Paul moves to the danger of self-confidence. And I love Paul's thinking here because he's told them to look out, watch out. But he knows what these Judaizers were doing. is like, Christ is pretty good, but pat myself on the back. I do good stuff too, you know? It's the flesh. And Paul's like, you want to boast in that? Let's just take a minute here and talk about boasting. So Paul says, though I myself if, it, if it's all about you instead of Jesus, let me tell you, it can be all about me too. Now, he's toying with them a little bit. I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. You want to you wanna believe in self-effort and your own goodness? I got more than anybody. He's getting real. He's getting personal. He is recounting in, in short statements his whole life's history. He's displaying his success. He's, he's just going to brag a little bit. Let me tell you about myself. And Paul is going to lay out what I call trophy cases. Two trophy cases. Now, when I was growing up, I, our family was uh, very active and a lot in sport. And my parents bowled. They were bowlers. And my dad was a very good bowler. And my sister rode horses and went to horse shows and horse fairs and even races. My brother played golf. I played baseball. And in our house, in our den in particular, but my sister's room was full of ribbons and things, were trophies, ribbons, plaques. Look what we did. Right? Look what we did. You come to our house. All right, I'll show you around. Oh, yeah, look. 
Paul is saying, why don't you come with me to my family room or why don't you come with me down to the man cave and I'll show you my trophies. And Paul has two trophy shelves here. The first one we could call the heritage trophy case. It's his bloodlines. Many years ago, without my knowledge, my family bought a basset hound. They, my wife calls me halfway to the place to get it. It was out somewhere, states or somewhere. Guess what? What? We're buying a basset hound. Oh, okay. But pure bread. So we're paying for it, but it's a female. She'll have puppies worth something. I mean, they do everything right to get this dog in the house. Paul says, pure blood Jew, circumcised on the eighth day from infancy, a Jew. And we might say, baptized, young, christened, dedicated. Paul says it goes way back. Of Israel. I'm not a proselyte. I'm not, I haven't been proselytized. I am not a convert. I am one of God's people of the best stock of Benjamin, an esteemed tribe, where Jerusalem and the temple were located, the origin of Israel's first king. And then he says, Hebrew of Hebrews. I am a pure Jew. I know the language, the culture. Both of my parents were Jewish. You want to boast? I've got you beat. And he probably did. Most people, he's got them beat. That's his heritage trophy case. But then he pulls out his personal effort or personal choice trophy case. As to the law of Pharisee. I was absolutely pure and righteous. I kept all the laws. There's 610 laws you were supposed to keep. I can do it. As to zeal, persecuting the church. And the way he says that in the present tense, it is a past sin that still haunts him. You want to know how zealous I was for my heritage? I persecuted Jesus. If zeal could save, I had it, but I was missing the mark. And Paul knows that it's only through Christ we can overcome the guilt and shame of our sins. He is our hope always. Paul's like, zealous, but... It's got to be about Christ. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. I made a plus. I had no outward flaws. People looked at me, model Pharisee, model Jewish believer. I could do it all. Paul was a spiritual workaholic. And if we're not careful, we fall into this mentality. It's so easy for us to forget what Christ has done. He's done it all. It's complete. It's finished. Trust him. What's a spiritual workaholic look like today? Goes to everything the church does. Keeps their marriage together. They're nice to others. They're honest. They keep the Ten Commandments. They follow the Sermon on the Mount. They keep the golden rule. They believe in God. They pray. They read their Bible. They look back at their baptism, their dedication, their Christian life. I'm in. I'm in. It's a frightening thought to think that we could be spiritual workaholics counting on our own works instead of always trusting in Christ alone for our salvation and our hope, and our assurance. Over the years, we've seen people lose their jobs 
after they applied. And sometimes it's in the business world. Sometimes it's in the athletic or coaching world. And people get hired for something. And then someone finds out that they weren't honest on their resume. And when it's found out, they're done. And Paul says, you see my resume? I mean, this is an impressive resume for a Jewish person, a leader, a Pharisee. Do you have a resume? Could you line up? It's always tainted. It always disqualifies us. There are sins and habits and rebellion and unbelief, and let's just face it. And why are we here? We're not here to try to add to our resume. If you understand the cross and the gospel, you're here because you met Christ. He's changed your life. He's given you hope. So we see the deception of false confidence, the danger of self-confidence, and now Paul develops confidence in God. Verse 7, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. All my personal advantages, all of my efforts counted as loss. Go into the trophy room, take all the trophies down, get rid of the plaques, the ribbons, anything that points towards me. Paul says, I look at it all, it's loss. It was worthless. All my positives are negatives to God. Scary thought. Religion, Paul says, is useless. It is replaced by relationship. A relationship with the living God, a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. Indeed, Paul says, I count everything as loss. All of life is worthless in comparison to knowing Christ. We did have a little sobriety check with COVID. We hope it doesn't come back, but certainly initially it made it. I thought it would do more, but it made us at least think about life and death, uh, our tentativeness, our fears. I thought maybe it would bring revival. It hasn't. I thought maybe it would help us look around and say, what is most important? I'm not sure. Certainly it hasn't for our nation. But Paul says, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I put it all behind so I can be like this with Christ. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. The word there actually is speaking of manure. Some translations say dung. Nicely, we would say poop. But a strong language. Paul says, I look at all, all those trophy cases. Rubbish is a light word. Paul has moved on from all of his efforts. In order that I may gain Christ. The word there, gain, means to, speaks of to make it my own, to, to be so embraced and close to him. I don't want any of those things getting in the way. And we all have things in our lives, in our world, that cause us to lose sight of Christ as we value them. You know, we live, in this, we live in this life God's put us here. We can enjoy this life and enjoy the things of life properly as he, as he shows us. He lets, that, he lets that, but 
Those little, those little things become idols, and they become deterrents from our walk with God. Paul says, I want him. I want this relationship with him. My oldest son, when uh, he was seven years old, he had a brief conversation with me where uh, he was talking about Christmas. We lived in Florida. And at that time, I think we were in uh, Clearwater, Florida. But uh, we would travel up to Greenville, South Carolina, my hometown, for Christmas every year, if possible. My mother just wanted us to be there, and we would come. And uh, so when he was uh, seven and a half years old, he, he had this conversation with me. He said, you know... When I think of Greenville, I always like Greenville because we go at Christmas and we get presents. And he said, and I kind of like wintertime. We were in Clearwater. Wintertime. And Paul Paul has a dog, and I, I like his dog. And he says, and Meemaw puts out this little uh, uh, gum tree. There's like a little plastic thing. You put gum uh, ball, you know, gum kinds of things on it, uh, gum drops. And he said, and I like I like Greenville for He said, but you know, now I realized I like Greenville because I get to be with Meemaw and Paw Paw. He's moved beyond all those positive, nice, external enjoyments, and he realized I get to be with my grandparents. And Paul says, get this all out of the way to gain Christ. And be found in him, verse 9, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from law. Well, he's, he's disregarding law, effort, works, all again. But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Religion is useless. It's, re it's replaced by relationship. Religion is useless. It is replaced by the righteousness of Christ. What do you have in your behalf when you stand before the judgment seat and Paul is actually, he's thinking about death. He's thinking about the end. He's thinking, I might be showing up at the judgment seat of Christ. What's going to count? Righteousness from God. Not my own righteousness. The death of Christ, the life of Christ. That's my only hope. Paul says, and I receive it by faith. I cast myself on his mercy. Give me Jesus. Give me life. Give me righteousness. Verse 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. When we gain Christ, we gain not only his righteousness, which the great evangelist George Whitfield used to say, pardon me if every time I preach, I talk about Christ's imputed righteousness, his righteousness given to me. Oh. But we gain not only that, but we experience power, power to overcome sin. We experience, and Paul is asking for this, to share in his sufferings. He's sharing in his sufferings at the very moment. And because he's like this, he doesn't mind sharing in Christ's sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. For the believer, that means separated from the old life, dying to self, finding victory in Christ and hope in Christ, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Someday after my death, I will be raised up. This is Paul's great hope. Right here in prison, wondering if he's going to make it around the corner. He does live for about four more years before he is put to death. He gets out and he travels some more, but eventually gets put to death. It's all about Christ, trusting in him. I think 
as we're here together, we probably know. I mean, we could maybe add up a little resume of good things that we do or have done or just being here or whatever. But I think we all realize each and every day I fail. I fall short of the glory of God. I sin in thought, word, and deed. The bottom line, as Harry Dent would say, is to, at the end, know Christ alone. It's not about me. It's all about him day in, day out. I've done nothing to add to his glory, his work on the cross, to anything. He's done it all, and I respond to his grace. With everything, Paul says. Let's pray. Father, we do want to give you our all, and we know we're reluctant. We know we're passive. We know we're weak. But we do pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to enable us to truly give you all that we have and to live for you only because of Christ your Son. We pray in his name. Amen.